Okay, good morning. Uh, let me figure out how this works. Yes, it does. Okay, good. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And um, it's so nice uh, for me to be here. It's my first Transcripus user conference, so please be nice. <laughs> but I have experienced um, some very nice um, chats already, so I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, well, let me start with a confession. Um, I am actually not a heavy Transcripus user. Um, well, I did some things with that, but uh, not too many and not too much. And I have um, heard or I have seen that there are people in this room who know much, much more about Transcribus than I do. And I feel a bit like an imposter. So I hope I can deal with that pressure. Um, I was very happy when uh, somebody told us yesterday that there are 80 million pages uh, or uh, documents scanned now, and that focus is slightly shifting now towards um, what is actually in these 80 million pages, because that's where I come into the picture and um, what I would like uh, to show you. But to be honest, without Transcribus, I would not be standing here. I could not um, have conducted any research so far. So I'm very grateful to all uh, the opportunities offered by Transcribus. Um, please keep the good work. Thank you so much. Um, well, when I started with everything, um, when I went to the archives in 2020, I felt pretty much like this. Can you relate? Somebody said, yeah, okay. Yeah, um, I had no idea about all the possibilities that I have with um, scanning documents or um, automatic transcribing documents. I just went to the archives because I was looking for something. And of course, the archive did not look a lot like that. It uh, looks like that. Neat and tidy. And what you see is the Bernese State Archive. Um, and uh, the, this is the corpus of the Bernese Tower Books. You will hear about that uh, quite a lot in the next uh, half an hour or so. Um, but well, I still felt like that. That's my state of mind because I figured out that I have not enough years to work on everything, uh, what is there and what is possibly interesting. And um, I also realized that I will never ever um, being able to read um, stuff like this. I was trained in um, actually dealing with, with um, um, historical uh, language scripts and historical stages of scripts, but this, oh. And now I actually think it's quite a nice one, to be honest. <laughs> Yeah. So then I heard about something like this, a scan tent. Um, I did some introductions and I found out that it's very, very easy to scan a lot uh, of documents of, in which I'm interested in a very short time. In my case, 40,000 pages. Um, it took me probably two, three, yeah, two weeks or something. So very, very quick. But uh, then the next problem came around. Um, how do I actually uh, work with that, with these pictures? And I heard of a device called um, Transcribus, which helps me um, transcribe everything what's in there without me being transcribing for the rest of my life. Um, and I was very grateful when I, I then learned a lot, of course, very slowly, and I made some progression and in the end, um, and with the help of students, my documents looked something like this. Okay. Well, that was a big step for me, and I was very, very optimistic, but what do I do now with all this data? I have now an amount, a huge amount of data flying around. Um, I'm a linguist. I'm interested in the language in these documents um, that I have scanned and now transcribed, and I know that I will never be able to read the, every single one of them because 40,000 pages, it's a lot, right? So, and that is actually what I'm going to talk about. How did I get the information out of um, this huge uh, pile, this huge amount of data I have? Um, I will talk um, about information extraction. And I will show you some tools that I used, namely um, named entity recognition and sentiment analysis. These two actually, they went well. Um, and then I will also talk about limitations. Um, I had problems or I still have problems with part of speech tagging. Um, many of you know that this is no problem basically, but for my document, it did not work at all. And then, okay, also I would um, like uh, to look into the future and ask what's next. 
But let me start with information extraction. Uh, we have heard a lot of it already. So basically, this enables researchers to convert vast, vast amounts of unstructured data into structured um, uh, forms that is easier to analyze. And for me, that is very crucial because without that, um, as I said, I would not be able to find anything about the language in these documents I'm looking at. And why do I do that? Well, information extraction offers new methods for analyzing complex data sets, um, and it uncovers a deeper historical, linguistic, and cultural insight into your data. I'm sure you have experienced that already. Why is it used? Well, in my case, it's historical documents. And um, of course, you can do it also with literary, contemporary literary work. Um, you could even uh, do it with fully digital archives, of course, and you can do it with social media content. Has any of you probably um, already looked on Twitter how or X, sorry, um, how many times uh, the Transcubus user conference was um, mentioned or linked? If you did, that's information extraction already. So you have done something on um, social media content. What are the challenges? So in my case, um, the variation um, in historical language um, pauses or, or um, gives some problems because um, historical, uh, historical language never comes around like modern language. You don't know when people switch into something which is probably more spoken-like data. You don't know whether a word still means the same as it means today. Um, there are so many things that I cannot predict. And sometimes because I asked the wrong question, um, I, I asked for the wrong information or I asked the wrong way to, to have the information extracted, um, I do not get the result that I want because the language is not the language I know best. So I have to dig deeper. I have to learn about the language in the books in order to find out what I really want to know. Um, yeah, I, figure, I figured out that my data is actually a small, small corpus. Um, many of you have vast <laughs> amounts of data with which I'm absolutely um, um, I'm impressed. My uh, tower books are 40,000 pages and this gives a corpus of 9 million tokens something. And I have learned that this is not too many, not too much, right? So, hmm, okay, sparse data is a problem in my case. Cement semantic ambiguity, as I said, I never know whether a word still means the same today as it meant uh, 500, 300 years ago. And this could actually lead to misunderstandings. I could interpret something in a way which it was not meant then. So I need to go into um, the development of that language and see whether there were some major changes in semantics in order to find out whether this still means the same. Um, and also, when you are looking for a very, very special result, you might not find it with information extraction because you don't know how to find it, where to find it, or what it could be actually. And why do I use machine learning for that? Well, machine learning automates and improves the efficiency of information extraction processes. We have heard about this yesterday. There is something called the supervised um, learning. Um, this predicts uh, patterns and outcomes in labeled data. That's basically when the data is annotated. And um, unsupervised learning is the same, but on unlabeled or um, un annotated data. And then there is um, natural language processing in which I'm very interested. And this actually enables computers to understand, interpret, and since, uh, very recently also generate human language. Um, you know about ChatGPT, of course. Um, when you use um, information extraction, you also have to, to some consideration that you have to take into account. Well, machine learning algorithms, they are always ethically biased and culturally loaded. So let's give me an example for the ethical bias. You remember that picture? Well, when I first, asked, um, actually they, they are all generated with uh, ChatGPT and Dali. And when I first asked ChatGPT to give me a picture of a failing archivist, he gave me this. He did not even question whether the, the, the person in the picture could be a woman or not. And then I said, well, the person in the picture should be a woman. And then he gave me <laughs> a woman. Well, I have a question. 
Do any of you guys who works in archives, uh, females, wear clothes like that in the archive? No? Okay. And also me as a researcher, I have never worn clothes like that. I, I never wore clothes like that at all today. So this is a typical um, picture generated by Chachi Pitti and Dolly um, showing a woman working in an archive. Well, what does that tell us? Hmm. Ultimately, I came to that picture and um, I had actually to go through um, several um, prompts. I needed to tell ChatGPT exactly what I want to. I want several people. I want men and women in the picture. I want paper fa uh, falling around. I want a messy archive. And then in the end, it gave me this picture. So this is a good example for a bias. Um, ChatGPT was just working with stereotypes and thought that people in the archives are mainly male. Well, okay. Good. What techniques do I use or what techniques are available? Um, I have just uh, here listed four. There are many, many more, of course, with which you can extract information from your corpus. Um, I very frequently use um, named entity recognition because it's in a state that it is applied to many different corpora and you can also um, just take um, pre-trained models and fine tune them. This is relatively easy. Um, some people do part of speech tagging very successfully. I know I'm not doing that. Mm -mm. Um, I do sentiment analysis with NLTK. Um, you can do topic modeling with GenSim or Mallet. I haven't tried this, but this is actually something that I will try in the future for sure. And as you see, well, there's much more. And we have also heard already about <clears throat> many more um, possibilities that you have with information extraction. So let me start with the first tool that I used, and this is named entity recognition. Well, what is this? Um, we heard about that yesterday a little bit, so this is probably a repetition. Named entity recognition is the process of identifying categories such as persons, locations, organizations, monetary values, um, dates and times, and so on. So um, especially when you want to know who and what and when um, of your documents, then um, if you ask questions like this, I um, really recommend to do um, named entity recognition. The corpus I used was the Bernese Witch Paper Corpus. I know I was not talking about that. This is coming. And my research questions that I had was how did personal name of socially lower class females in the city state of Bern evolve in the early modern period? And so my question was very specific. This is, of course, um, of a because of a reason. Um, there is much research going on on personal names, the involving um, personal names in historical times but not for Switzerland. And I had to actually really size it down to lower class females, which I have in my documents, and also say only from the city state of Bern because this is the documents I have and only for Switzerland. Um, other people have done the rest of the research already. So the corpus, um, the Bernese witch paper, um, they are a part of the Bernese Tower book. So. In these books that I have showed you in the archive in the very beginning, um, you have uh, some witch papers. And I um, was looking for them. I found them because there is something like keyword spotting in transcribers, and that helped a lot. Um, and I found um, these um, papers. But basically, the Bernese Tower books are protocols of criminal re criminal trials, and they were recorded in the Towers of Bern, and the Towers of Bern are here. If you have been to Bern already, um, there is the Grafikturm, that's this one. This is still existent, was a prison, is today a forum for exhibition and uh, political discussions. And then there was the Marzilli Turm, so the tower here. Um, he was solely used uh, for torturing people, so they were brought from this um, place to this place when they were tried or tortured, unfortunately. Um, the Bernese Tower books are chronological summaries of statements of arrested persons and witnesses. Um, you find information about verdicts and also about um, execution that depends on the time um, when the paper is actually uh, was written. And very many of these papers were um, 
um, recorded under torture. And um, sometimes you can see that the handwriting of the clerk is changing in the middle of a process or in the middle of a trial. And um, also you can see that these papers are recorded in winter when it was dark and cold or at, in, in the evening when the light was sparse. So uh, sometimes it's a bit difficult to make sense of what is written there because of um, the quality of the handwritten, of the handwriting. So um, this is a, a, just a random page of a tower book of, uh, I think, 1551. Um, the tower books are accessible in the Bernese State Archives. You just you have just seen them and the protocols um, go from 1547 to 1798. The whole corpus is approximately 300,000 pages on 11 running meters in the archive. So I have just scanned a very, very small part, 40,000 pages, which is definitely enough for me to conduct my research. Um, it's all handwritings and it's all in German current. There are some French um, papers in it. And of course, uh, the French language is not written in uh, the German current. As I said, I have um, digitized 40,000 pages and yeah, 9 million tokens. And I trained it down um, on a character error rate from 8 to 10% with HR plus long time ago. And um, well, 8 to 10% does not sound really sophisticated, I know, but you have to keep in mind that this corpus is extremely heterogeneous. You have um, the hands changing sometimes more than once a year. Um, there are sometimes the city clerks changing and they give instructions on how uh, the, the court clerks have to write. So this is all in the documents and you cannot uh, make batches of, of one clerk or one city clerk. That would make no sense. So the Bernie Switch papers, um, these are approximately 90,000 tokens. So it's 1% of the whole Tower Book corpus. And I had to make batches of 30 to 40 years because my computer was um, running hot and not performing as I wanted. And when I sized down the data, it was easier um, to perform information extractions. Um, these are uh, 172 um, handwritten documents, um, each one uh, consisting of several pages, and I found 67 women and 15 men in these papers. So how did I apply named entity recognition to the historical documents? I uh, have chosen a supervised approach because the data was pre-labeled um, or a part of the data. There was training data available. We had um, students um, working on these papers, learning um, how um, to annotate a corpus. And it was relatively easy to tell them how to annotate um, named entities. Um, Bernie, the Bernie's Tower books were the main corpus, but we also took several other corpora into account as secondary corpus. And you see um, the performance of the model here. And when you look at it very briefly, um, you see that the F1 score for um, the person tag and the location tag is fairly okay, but doesn't make any sense for, sense for the organization tag. Why is this the case? Um, when we gave the students the instruction how to tag a person or a location, we could actually have, we, we were very, very specific, but with the, with the organization, we just didn't know what we find. We told them um, the court is an organization and the Confederation of now Switzerland is an organization. But there was, of course, much more. There were churches, there were um, old monasteries, uh, schools and so on. And um that was tagged in very different ways. So that's why the F1 score is, um, well, you can't work with that, of course. But for me, I was just looking at the person tags and I think on historical documents, um, that's quite, these are quite reasonable numbers. So then I wrote some Python code. I um, had uh, here the model loaded and then one batch of the corpus. And I also told my, told my code not only to give me the named entity, not just the name, but also seven elements which are written on the right side of the named entity tag. Why did I do that? I was um, specifically interested in gender marking at um, certain words. And um, these words are not necessarily the named entities, but sometimes um, the place of living of a person or the profession of a person. And they are always in um, the German language, well, always, most of, often they are on the right side of the person tag. So that's why I have given seven. Why seven? I tried five and that did not work. I had seven that worked and 10 was too much. So I went back to seven. 
what did I found? Um, well, the first thing is, of course, um, people or women in my papers are mentioned by first name and last time name, and this is but more or less consistent. Let's say 50% of these persons are mentioned with their full name, what we consider today, today a full name. We have also um, some percentage for first name, last name and place. Um, well, that's not very um, uh, surprising. What does literature say so far? Well, there is a famous study by uh, Damaris Nübling. She uses German um, documents from today's Germany. And um, she says that here in the middle of the 16th century, um, family name, so the last name, starts to become a, a fixed um, entity on a person's um, name or identification. And because... Uh, Look at this number. Here I'm already at 50%. So I guess that in Switzerland, this might have started a bit earlier, like probably something like here, because it's already at 50% in the middle of the uh, 16th century. So, but basically, I can <clears throat> confirm what she has found. Yes, somewhere in the 15th, 16th century, also in Switzerland, um, family name has has have become a part of um, a person's identity. What else did I find? I was talking about gender marking. Gender marking is always mentioned with GM gender marking. So I have um, some instances here. And um, what I what is really interesting is that in the first batch, I hardly do find any uh, gender marking at the female name, which is for a later stage um, quite um, regularly done. But also percentages are very low. Um, you don't have to go through the whole table. Um, what does literature say here? Well, not much, to be honest. Um, this is the first study on the involvement of gender marking of socially lower class females in document exclusively from Switzerland. Uh, Miriam Schmuck, um, 2016, points at the very poor databases in Switzerland when she was looking at uh, which papers from Germany. Um, well, yes. There was no corpus at that time because the German, uh, the, the Tower Book corpus is probably one of the first ones. Um, and um, she finds seven papers, which papers, um, which originate directly from the border to Germany. And what she also finds, interestingly, her percentages at gender marking are much higher, but they are ever average for what she finds in Germany. And I guess that this points towards an influence from what was then Germany towards the language situation in Switzerland. Um, yeah, okay. Let's have a look at my second tool that I used. It's sentiment analysis. And what do we do when we uh, do sentiment analysis? Sentiment analysis actually um, identify, extracts or quantifies information such as emotions or opinions. Um, it's very, very often used today, for example, uh, for marketing or um, customer feedback, um, sometimes also for social uh, media monitoring. So when you when we going back to our ex corpus of people who mentioned the TUC 24, when you extract whether their um, comments were positive or negative, you have done sentiment analysis already. Um, always they're used in, in political campaigns because you want to know uh, whether people are pro or contra something. Um, the paper or the corpus I've chosen for this task was the Salem Witch Paper Corpus. I will tell you why in a second. Um, and my research questions were very basic. I just wanted to see whether it is possible to apply um, sentiment analysis to pre-modern unlabeled data. And if yes, whether I can, <clears throat> whether I can quantify and visualize um, these sentiments and also what sentiment analysis could tell us for linguistics or how we could use it in linguistics. So the Salem Witch Papers, um, there was a, or is a huge project with the Salem Witch Trial Documentary Archive and Transcription Project. Um, they have uh, transcribed and digitally made available um, court records, record books, um, personal letters, um, and so many more. You can see them here. Uh, when you go on this uh, QR code, um, you will um, end up on this homepage, which I highly recommend. And there is also some background information about the accused person so that there is some metadata available. 
And how did this come to be? Uh, very um, briefly, so the Salem witch hunt took place in 1692 and 1693. And in the end, 30 persons were, uh, 32 persons were found guilty. 19 have been uh, um, executed and one died under torture and five died in the aftermath of um, torture. The end of the trials were in, 19, uh, in 1693 when the state governor actually ended the whole thing. So I don't know how this would have been been going on if he would not have ended everything. And there were eight persons, guilty persons, um, which were released in the end. So, as I said, the corpus is digitally available and accessible. Um, the papers, yeah, I said how old they are. There are actually 140 transcribed trial papers available. I took only 95. Why? Um, 95 papers um, ended up to be a corpus of approximately 90,000 tokens, which is comparable to the size of the witch papers from Bern with which I was looking at. So I hope that I can somehow add a point in time and um, compare also linguistically speaking what is in these um, corpora. Um, there are 21 males and 74 females accused of witchcraft. So how did I apply it? Well, I have chosen as an unsupervised approach because the data is not labeled. And I took the pre-trained tool um, uh, data, uh, data toolkit NLTK. Um, for those who have already been working with sentiment analysis, this is actually old stuff. You don't do that today anymore. But um, I have tried several tools and NLTK worked best for this variety of English um, over all other tools. So I stick with the old stuff. Um, when you do um, sentiment analysis, of course, you have to write some code and you load a lexicon. And that is actually one possibility how you can do um, sentiment analysis, especially when you have unlabeled data. So the code, your model comes up with a lexicon of um, predefined words, which could be um, positive, negative, or also neutral. And I have listed some of them here below. Positive is love, joy, peace, um, negative, hate, fear, devil, and neutral, a book, a table, water. And also I found out that almost all stop words um, are uh, neutral words. So it's also a mean to exclude stop words when you do sentiment analysis. Well, probably a bit of a complicated one, but you can do it like that as well. What did I find? So I wanted to know whether sentiment analysis is even possible on historical documents. And as you can see, yes, it is. Um, very, very little positive, very much negative, and some neutral, which I did not make any sense of it so far. Um, I wanted to know what the sentiments are. So what is a positive sentiment in the corpus and what is a negative sentiment? Positive, something like peace, great faith, negative, uh, tormented, wickedly, but also, as I said, the devil is in the corpus. What else? I was then looking at um, the per person's trial paper. So I looked at um, Salem Witch Paper 93, Deliver and Stain, and I was, this is actually one with a negative sentiment. And I was interested in what is actually um, responsible for uh, this negative sentiment. And there's stuff like suffered, devil, imprisonment, afflict, and so on. Um, a positive um, uh, so a paper is the one is a uh, so which paper 061 from Eunice Fry, and you have words like virtue, grace, faith, and so on in this um, um, corpus. So, yes, I can also display the words that I am looking at or the sentiments that I'm looking at. And then I was also interested whether there is a correlation between the sentiment of a certain paper and the verdict. And I have made some groups to make a little bit more sense of everything. So just keep in mind, all these persons have been found guilty and they have all been in prison. They just, the outcome is different. So for those who were executed, um, only negative sentiments in the paper. For those who died, <clears throat> sorry, for those who died under torture, um, there was at least some neutral sentiment. And for those who were still found guilty and waited to be executed, um, there was one person who had even a positive sentiment in a paper which then led still to an execution. Isn't that a bit strange? Well, I must tell you, I was of course looking into that paper and it is, it is the witch paper of a little girl. 
So I guess that that's why the clerk is framing um, the whole trial in a more positive way than he does um, with all the others. Sad, isn't it? Very sad. Okay, how can I use sentiment analysis for linguistics? Um, I, it, in social linguistics, at least, it's not used very widely. Um, it could support the understanding um, of semantic change because can I be sure that a negative sentiment, something that I find today to be a negative sentiment, was also a negative word then? So I have to go through um, the literature again and see how did English in this case change? Um, were there any semantic changes of what we know and which could actually influence my understanding of the sentiment? Probably the neg not all the negative sentiments are really negative, right? Um, there is a big research field um, called language and emotion. And concerning this research field, um, I think that sentiment analysis is or could be a very helpful tool. Um, this is an interdisciplinary field, comes from linguistic psychology, um, cognitive sciences, and so on. And um, sentiment analysis could actually facilitate the identification of emotion in a certain corpus. Um, you have seen that this works also for um, historical documents. And interestingly, <clears throat> when I was looking at the Bernese Tower books, I found out, or I had the feeling, that for some persons, the clerks used um, more, not positive, but the language felt like to be closer to the person, like, like they had a certain um, relationship to that person, but I had no proof. So I run some sentiment analysis and I found out for exactly those where I had this odd feeling, um, the, the sentiment in this um, trial papers were actually positive. And interestingly, it's only uneducated men and women in general. So sentiment analysis could actually really help us to um, explain also why the tone in some trial papers differs a lot. Okay, let's move on to the not so nice bit. Well, I was very, very optimistic because the two um, um, tools or two approaches I have shown you so far, I uh, had them first, I run them first, and I thought, okay, this is working so well. Let's do some part of speech tagging because this is going to work anyway. The other ones worked as well. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so part of speech tagging is, um, or part of speech are categories um, that classify words based on their grammatical functions. Um, in a sentence such as noun verbs and so on. So when your teacher in fourth grade actually asked you to depict what role a word plays in a sentence, you did part of speech tagging already. Um, it is today used to analyze, analyze sentence structures, to understand language patterns, language evolvement, and um, also language development, and many, many more. Um, I used the whole Bernese Tower Corpus book, uh, corp the whole Bernese Tower Book Corpus and um, quite a lot of data, I know. And my research question was, I was very optimistic, remember, um, how is the early modern official written language in the Bernese Tower Books different from other early modern official written languages in Switzerland? It would have been a blast if that worked. Well, what was the problem? Or no, first, how did I do it? Um, I did a supervised approach because the data, you have seen it before, has been labeled. We had the students also label some uh, POS categories. Um, the data was annotated directly in transcribers and the model training failed dramatically. The F1 score below, I haven't printed you all the numbers because they're so depressing. Um, the F1 score is below 30% and I gave up. So why? Well, uh, the language in the Bernese Tower books is interspersed with probably and most likely dialect. And the models I took um, were pre-trained on modern languages and then fine-tuned on tags that I had, that my students made on a pre-modern language. And that caused the model just to blow up. Um, Bernese, the Bernese dialect was just not identifiable for machine for the machine learning algorithms. And uh, well, as I said, they're not trained for that. And how can I improve that? Well, I need much, much, much more training data and I need to annotate more data and to train my own models for this particular language. And we are working on it. And I will let you know when I succeed, but this could actually take a while. 
Okay. What's next? Um, when I was putting the slides together for this um, talk, suddenly it came to my mind whether I could also just ask ChatGPT to extract some information. And I was really hoping that it can't do that for historical documents, because it, if it could, this would all have been for nothing. So two years of research, poof, blown up. Um, well, does it work for historical texts? Wait. Let me see whether I can. It is, it is running. Okay, so I uploaded um, a document and said, extract some information. I said, no, I first need to my, do te um, text recognition, and um, then you find out that it can't do OCR and the German documents. Um, it suggests me how to go on with the OCR process. Okay, then I said, okay, well, I understand. I'll give you a transcription like this is what I have been doing two years. Oh, sorry, <laughs> that was too quick. Um, I don't go back, it's too complicated. Well, it has told me that the paper, the transcription of the one um, witch trial paper from the Bernese Corpus that I have just randomly chosen, um, who is in that paper, where this person comes from, what she was actually accused of, um, when the trial took place, um, who were the judges, who were witnesses, um, um, how the outcome of the trial was. And also, thank you very much, dear ChatGPT, it said that the language is in a pre-modern state and it uh, um, requires specialist knowledge to um, work on that. Okay. Well, <laughs> okay, let me sum up. So information extraction on historical documents in combination with machine learning approaches can be very beneficiary, um, at least for me as a linguist. Um, the extraction of almost um, any data type is possible and relatively quick and easy. Um, there is probably some coding required, but inside a tip, ask ChatGPT. It knows how to code, so. If you want to extract information and you need a code, go ask ChatGPT. Um, information extraction facilitates the interdisciplinary understanding and not only um, of the data set, but also of the historical situation. Because sometimes when you have um, your Im information extracted, you learn that there is much more knowledge um, um, necessary than just my linguistic understanding. I have to work with um, historians to understand. I have to work with um, personal, um, persons um, very uh, experienced on historical law, law and so on. So you have to work together in order to, um, to make sense of the information that you have just extracted. But um, information extractions um, are sometimes only gives an overview. You have to keep that in mind. Um, we have to keep that um, in mind that algorithms are biased. I've shown this and that certain data points are therefore excluded. So if I would not have asked for a female um, archivist in, in that picture, there would have been none. I needed to ask for more. Um, and you can do that with information extraction, of course, as well. And Algorithms sometimes are very general. That's the reason why you don't find the one data point you absolutely wanted to find. Um, and also sometimes it misses the one data point which makes you or my research so very, very special. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for this very insightful uh, keynote. Are there any questions from the audience? That was a shy one, but is there a question? Yeah. <laughs> All righty. There you go. Hi, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, my question would be, have you considered uh, using synthetic data for post, uh, part of speech tagging? And if you have or have not, what would be the uh, benefits? Thank you. No, I have not. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Short answer to that one. What was that? Oh, yeah. Go on. Um, one question about the last part. You mentioned that the problem with ChatGPT is that it often doesn't show, uh, like, or often 
just um, mixes up information or leaves out information. So I was wondering, because I encountered that too, that sometimes the issue is opposite, that ChatGPT adds actually information that is not even there. Mm -hmm. Have you encountered this when you tried it out? Um, not in respect of my historical documents, but when I was playing around, yes, of course, um, a little anecdote, um, you know, ChatGPT chat GPT is very, very dangerous, of course. And um, when it came up and, and universities feared that students might write their papers with ChatGPT, um, Tobias Hodel and I, we have been asked to go uh, to our university um, faculty meeting and to talk about ChatGPT and about what it does and what it does extra and what it can't do. And then um, we had, we asked ChatGPT about the Dean. So we asked, do you know this person? And can you tell me what this person's achieved in his life? And <laughs> he has won prizes he has never won. So it adds a lot of uh, stuff. And of course we could show that to the faculty then and um, they found it very um, interesting and funny, but uh, yeah, this is a problem. Yeah, you always, I mean, there is now actually even a warning saying, be careful with the information chat TPT gives you because it could be wrong. You have to check that. And I, yeah, please do that. All right. Any more questions? We also have some questions online. Mm -hmm. One very short one. Can the sh uh, slides be shared? Oh, yes, of course. It's PDF. So I'll, yeah, drop, yeah. I'll drop a link then. And another one, um, rather interesting one. Um, are there examples of sentiment analysis applied to satirical texts when often inverted meanings for their effect? Yes, they are. Um, there are. Um, um, I was working with a colleague from the University of Warwick um, for that. He actually have chosen a different approach um, in sentiment analysis. So he is not looking for the sentiments themselves, but he looks on a scale between positive and negative, whether a, 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 um, uh, the sentiment of a certain text is rather more positive or negative. So, so he has not um, this um, black and white outcome as I do, but he was looking at at satiric text and and these children's children's poems rhymes where you where you learn some things to pronunciate and they do mean something very different, and um, yes, of course it cannot master that. It says it's positive or negative as the general tone, but it does not understand the underlying sentiment at all. All right. Any more questions from the chat? No. Okay. There is another question. Flo, maybe you can hand the microphone. Sure. Thank you, Krista. That's amazing. I have a question regarding the part of speech tagging and the underwhelming results. Mm. Uh, did you normalize the, uh, the punctuation because uh, neural taggers rely on they need to know when a sentence starts and when it yes. ends. Yes, we did that. We tried it um, with and without punctuate, punctuation. Um, we even um, decided to normalize a part of the data that something linguists never, never, never do normally. But we even tried the normalization of the text, um, but still there was too much noise in it so that the model did not perform. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, following up on that, um, could you ask ChatGPT to normalize into modern German? I, I feel for Middle Dutch, it works quite well to have it modernize into modern Dutch and then have your uh, part of speech tagging based on a modern German model or maybe directly ask ChatGPT to do, do all the work for you. Okay, the second part I surely did, <laughs> but um, no, I have never thought about the first one and I will definitely try. It, yes, it, thank it you so much. It performs really well when you ask, for example, yeah. I've tried it for French and for uh, Dutch, yeah. and it performs really well in okay. translating to modern uh, variants. So what I have been doing, um, that's, a, that's a very quick and dirty way, and I hope this is going to work for my data. That would be fantastic. What I have tried is um, I had some spoken data, which was um, children's data, which was 
sometimes standard language and sometimes not so much standard language. And I have had it um, transcribed on Whisper. Um, and Whisper actually, um, if you take the the simplest, the smallest model, it will normalize everything. Um, and if you take the large one, I guess, um, it gives you definitely dialect. And so for, for this mixture that we have very often in Switzerland, there is hope, but still I have no spoken historical data. That's a problem. Yeah. Thank you. One more question in the middle. <laughs> Get a run around it. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you so much for this talk. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, if you could talk a little bit more about the um, how you conceived of the training data and sort of how you sort of conceptualized um, what you were going to tag and how you were going to tag it for your supervised approach to the named entity recognition on the which papers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd love to hear anything more you might have to say about um, sort of beginning that process and mm -hmm. thinking it through. Thanks. Yes. Um, well, <laughs> to be honest, um, we did not think that through at all in the beginning because we were teaching a research seminar with master's students at the University of Bern. And our basic interest was to um, have them learn how to tag. And that's why we came up with some random tag sets. Of course, we were looking into the literature and found some um, stuff that makes sense. And we just had them tag. And then, um, interestingly, they were all very keen on tagging the stuff. I don't understand why, because that's what I do not really like in my work, like tagging stuff, right? And um, then we, we started to focus only on the named entity tags, and we had them just tag um, names, places, and organizations for a start. Um, sometimes we had some students, they were um, absolutely fantastic, and they did also tag um, dates, for example. And that was a good thing because um, transcribers had problems to identify the numbers. And because we, we then had this... Um, untranscribed thing, we could exclude it from the very beginning because there was a tag. So that was um, a good thing. And and I know that there is a project in Basel where they also tagged monetary values. And um, we were just orienting towards our data. So we, we were, of course, looking on how could you identify or what is a name tag, but we then um, made it um, or we we trailer made it towards our data and we had annotation sessions with our students where they just came in and asked questions about um, problematic cases where they weren't unsure how to tag the stuff. So um, sometimes, yeah, just go ahead and see what happens, I guess. Thank you. Yep. Question from you. Um, was there a correlation between the character error rates and what you did afterwards? So, for example, for the part of speech tagging, because 10%, that's a lot of noise and can throw off an NLP pipeline significantly. No, there was not, um, but um, only for the named entity um, model. And this was trained mainly by Ismail Prada Ziegler, the model, and we did it together and um, he trained... Um, he tried it also with um, data without any um, errors and it performed the same way. So that was a big issue that we had because we weren't sure whether we had only 85% because of the character error rate. And even um, the model, um, I will I will let make um, publish my slides because there is a QR code that leads you to Hugging Face and to the, um, uh, the model. The model also performs at an F1 score at 85% when the data is not uh, transcribed at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, because um, uh, part of speech tagging is a harder problem if you have noise in the data. Yes. Because named entities stand out more, yeah, yeah grammatically, definitely. basically. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so that may be another avenue yes. that you could mm -hmm. pursue to see how strong an effect is there. Yeah. Because if it's not there, then yeah. Yeah, yeah, you, you're absolutely right. It doesn't pay to, to yeah. invest in it. Yeah, and this in thirty percent below thirty percent F one score also tells us that we have to work more on our data. We have to 
transcribe it properly we manually of course and and um, we have to check it we have to check the annotations that the students made we have to annotate more data yes 